Um, this is OK here. And we're going to be doing a review of um, my games as board two of the team Caruana leaked our prep um, in season 15 of the Lee Chess 4545 League. Hi there, Abos. says Black looks crushed. So yeah, the position I, I am just going to start with while I was waiting for people to, to come in um, was my very first uh, first round match. Um, and my opponent is Black found a very nice move here. He's done an exchange. I've won his rook in the corner um, for my bishop. Um, pawn situation, yeah, he's down pawns even as well, one, two, three, four, five. Down a pawn and an exchange, but he found a really nice move in this position. So I wonder if anyone in chat can see it. So we'll definitely come back to it if no one does see it. Um, and so just to say more about the Lee Chess 4545, um, so every week you're paired with an opponent on the opposing team. Uh, it's designed so that you play people of approximately equal strength. Um, so board one plays board one, board two plays board two, and so on. And if you're doing well in the league, you play other teams who are doing well, and it's um, an eight round and eight week event with one, one pairing each week. Um, and if you can't play one week or a couple of weeks, that's completely fine. You just mark yourself as unavailable for that week and uh, an alternate will be chosen. So you can play as a, as a full time team member or you can actually just drop in and play uh, the odd game here and there as an alternate. Um, and if you're, as I said, if you're an alternate, uh, a message will go out saying, is anyone free to play this game? Whereas if you're a permanent member, um, it's the other way around. It's you play every game unless you're not free and then you say, oh, can someone take my place? Um, and I had a very interesting uh, set of eight games, which is why I felt I really wanted to do a review of the eight games. So anyone seen Black's move in this position? If not, we'll, we'll be definitely coming back to it. Okay, well, we'll 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 come we'll come to it. Okay, so um, I was on the team. Um, Karana leaked our prep. Uh, we had Erin Yu as board one. Um, board one's usually rated from two thousand to two thousand three hundred in Lee Chess Classical. Um, so I was on um, board two. So usually someone rated between 19, 1900 and two thousand. Uh, we had Rail Robert uh, on board three. Um, and then we had Adande, My Son Never Call Me, and Zero on our other boards. And actually it's very interesting, it was six boards, but it's very interesting because um, in, the, in the upcoming season, which is just starting next week, there will in fact be eight boards, so it's a big change happening, happening to the, the format of Lee Chess 45, 45 in the upcoming season. Uh, and I'm again going to be board two. But I won't be playing next week. Um, okay, so so this is my round one game. I was white against Jonathan Coffin, uh, and as you can see from the hopefully from the little image um, that you get. Let's see. Can you see it? Okay. Hopefully you can see. Uh, there's. Um, Hopefully you can see and hear me fine. Um, I'm assuming that because I haven't haven't got feedback to the contrary. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So this is going to be a classical king's Indian. Um, D4, knight f6. So um, white grabs the center. D6 just to stop white completely dominating with e B5 push. Castles, um, bishop e2, um, and yeah, this is all very standard. Um, so 
So the, this this dark squared bishop is often a really useful defender for the king. So playing bishop e3 first just avoids the bishop from being locked out by the very quick push of f5, f4. So often bishop e3 is quite useful so that when f5, f4 comes, the bishop just slots back in on f2. And this is quite a good defender for the white king. But this is all very, uh, very classical king's Indian stuff. Okay, so and what happens in the king's Indian, of course, is that black attacks on the king side, um, while white attacks on the queen side. Uh, and it's, it's a general principle in, in any um, position is you want to attack where you have a space advantage. And obviously white's got a space advantage on the queen side, so it's a very natural thing to do. Although, as, you'll, as we'll see later, we'll have another king's Indian as my very last match, in which that something completely different happened. Uh, but this is the, the traditional, the very classical king's Indian. Um, so black going all out against my king, uh, while I'm just supporting rook c1, just pushing through. Okay, so I've got, and I've got these nice bishops staring, <laughs> not, not, not bad, uh, staring into the, uh, into the queen side, while uh, black has this very beautiful bishop staring, which is often, you can even, this is a very important bishop, you never want to lose this bishop, because if ever white plays h3, uh, black might want to sacrifice that bishop on h3, and just completely blow open white's position. Um, and the thing about the king's Indian is white does have an edge, but black has the advantage that he's attacking the king side. So um, if white if white breaks through, he's winning material. If black breaks through, he's he's mating. Um, okay, so now, now very interesting. Okay, so I, I'm threat. I'm, the knight comes in threatening c7 and a7, um, and black it completely ignores actually the threats on the queen side and I think that was um, and so he, he just ignores the fact the knight can slot in here and then the rook is trapped so um, so that was a bit of a mistake um, from from my opponent from Jonathan Coffin uh, he could have played a move like um, here what could he have played a move like uh, let's just consult it's already gone a bit far, I think. Um, so it's already awkward by this point. I mean, he could play a move like b6, but let's see. Have we already left the opening explorer? Um, yes. Okay, so actually a very subtle point. Um, no, this is correct. Feel like there's a subtle mistake he made. Yes, I, I remember what this mistake is. Yes. Now I'm wondering here. Um, that is not the correct move. Moving this knight. Um, that knight is temporarily guarding um, the queen side. So traditionally, you actually move uh, the other knight first. Um, so you keep this knight just to move longer. You go knight g6 and then knight f6. And just for exactly this reason, um, if you play knight g6 first, well, I go c takes d6, c takes d6, uh, knight to b5, um, it's not nearly so much of a problem because this knight is now uh, guarding this c7 square. Um, black can just kick this knight away with a6, for example. Um, and I'd say maybe white is slightly better just because white is white in this position. Um, so knight f6 is, I should say, is a, a slightly dubious move. Um, and I'd say that was the beginning of, of black's problems in this position because then the knight comes in and and there was a threat which was ignored. Maybe, maybe b6 would be um, a way of of parrying that threat, um, yeah. Then it's then it's not clear. Um, so b6 would have been a, a good move at this point, but still white is white is say better um, in this position. But okay, now knight c7 and the rook is just simply trapped. Takes, takes. 
Uh, and then there's something else, which when I saw this um, exchange of this um, light squared bishop, this is again something which you really don't normally want to do um, in the King's Indian because that's that's Black's good bishop. I mean, this, the fintetted bishop, of course, is really important because it's defending the king, but it's it's staring at a wall of black of dark coloured pawns. So, yeah, this move again is. Uh, slightly dubious because you're, you're exchanging off the nice bishop, um, and probably that's what I should have done. I, I probably should have just taken that bishop straight away, um, and instead of even taking the rook, just uh, put my knight to e6. Um, and this is just sort of a kind of line that you, you could have, for example. Um, I wonder. Yeah, I, I am forced to. I am forced to to exchange that bishop for the rook. Um, so this this uh, rook trap had be actually been seen before um, in in masters games, and surprisingly, the, the game in that case went like this: with g takes f three, bishop takes f three, and, and although this is plus three for stockfish, uh, that game actually ended in a draw. So it gives you an idea how these positions, although white is clearly winning, um, so actually. That was the end of the um, of how that's how it went along with the game. Rook c7 was the engine move for how white could have improved on that game, um, maybe done better. So rook c7, knight g6, bring the queen in, exchange rooks, and white's basically got now a very stable setup. Uh, you know, it's not, um, yeah, the queen will probably come to c8 to stop the rook coming to c1, but um. Um, but this is uh, white is simply a, an exchange up, and there's no there's no danger, there's no sort of instability in the position. Um, but instead of that, uh, so Jonathan Coffin went for rook to b8, um, takes takes takes, and as I said here, I should have exchanged off bishops and then taken the rook, or even gone knight here and then taken off the rook. Um, but I took the rook first which was maybe slightly worse, takes back. And I was very concerned about the queen coming in with check, picking up the pawn and marauding in my queen side. Uh, so I stepped aside. Again, not a bad move, but maybe a slightly better move was again to, to exchange off the bishops. Um, so just to takes, takes, and then even something like 96, if you did something like this. Um, even saying, well, I don't, I don't even want to exchange that knight for the rook. It's such a beautiful knight uh, in um, in black's position, and this knight will just defend that pawn. And yeah, we're up in exchange, and again, we've got a quite stable position. And actually, the queen is a bit offside on on that side of the board. Um, okay, but after king h1, he went um, knight takes e4, just exploiting. The pin on this bishop. I thought no bad thing because I want to take that bishop anyway and then take this pawn. Um, and then he went rook f6. And so the rook is swinging into some kind of kingside attack. Um, and the move I, I should have played in this position was uh, knight to e6 with obviously a sort of mating one threat. Um, the reason I didn't is just simply because he has a very easy um, defense, rook g6, hitting my queen with tempo, and I didn't feel this was, yeah, queen e2. Well, that's giving away something, but yeah, these sorts of ideas. Um, so apparently this this is slightly better for white, but it's quite, it's quite... Quite precarious, but yeah, apparently this is just basically just one tempo slightly better. Um, or after king g1, rook h7, yeah. So in this position, um, just to give a sense of the danger to white. 
can can people in since, since I haven't had much comment from chat. So can anyone in chat tell me what the what is the danger in this position? If if White were to play a, a null move, a null move is a move that doesn't actually do anything. So it's it's like passing the move. So if, if white were to play a null move, what would black play in this position? So I'm just going to open that up to chat just to make sure that you guys can hear me and um, the stream is working properly. And then just to get some interaction. So can anyone in chat tell me what black plays here? If not, I'm going to have to tune in to make sure. Yeah, so can you see a specific line that black black could play? Yeah, so if, if simply queen h5, this queen takes g3, so that doesn't work. Um, there's a very there's a very common tactic in this position that, that you should recognize. Um, Something much much more forcing, uh, and it's a good one to know. What's it called? It, it even has a name. Like, is it Damiano's mate? No, it it can't remember which one it is. But okay, so the tactic in this position. Yes, so a boss has got it. Sacking the rook. Just simply sack the rook just to get the king on the file. And, and there are examples where you just bring another rook in, sack that rook as well, and when you bring the queen in, check, there's nothing to block, and queen here is checkmate. Um, so this, this is sort of the inherent danger in this position. Um, so, so even back here, I, I, I am recognizing, okay, things are not so... Well, no, actually, at this point, I'm still, I was still quite confident, and I, I just retreated. I, I'm a little bit worried about rook to h6. I wasn't. Uh, the move I missed was the move that black plays in this position, which you, um, yeah, yellow. Well done, rook h1 as well. So, Abos and yellow uh, can clearly hear me talking, and the stream is working, so that's good. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try and make it a bit more interactive as we go along, because uh, that'll be more fun. So, what's the move for black in this position? Because this is. This is the great move that uh, Jonathan Coffin found. Uh, it deserves the double X clam, which I'm going to give it when we when I play it. So what's the move? And just to say, by the way, is I'm going to post this video um, up on YouTube later, and I'll put the study link along with it. And just to post uh, my YouTube link, I, I'm usually a, a streamer of Crazy House, but just to let you know. That's where I post my stuff. Occasionally I post some chess stuff. I posted a very interesting uh, geometry of chess video, for example. But um, uh, And I posted a review of my season 12 games. So that was three seasons ago. Um, OK, so what was the wonderful move that Jonathan Coffin found in this position? So he's, a, he's down a pawn. He's down an exchange. And yet he finds a really nice tactic in this position. And it's not a winning tactic or anything. It's just a move that makes the position interesting. Uh, if you'd ask Stockfish, it would say the position is drawing with this move, whereas any other move that your 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 is plus three for white. So you've seen it in the other variation already. Can you? Can anyone in chat tell me what move to play as black? Knight g3, yes. Well done, yellow. Uh, knight g3, uh, I'm going to say that's a double x uh, move. I'm forced to take this knight because it's a fork on my king and queen. Uh, and this is going to create... Um, it's going to create just 
just a sort of precariousness to my king. At the moment, black actually doesn't have enough pieces to follow up the attack. Um, so taking um, taking on g3 immediately, for example, um, doesn't work because just rook takes rook, bishop takes. Black doesn't have black simply doesn't have enough pieces, and so that's why this move just hadn't occurred to me. Um, but what's the um, the brilliant follow up is knight f5, um, and now you're threatening knight takes g3 and um, so I should say f takes g3 would be would be a blunder. But knight f5, and now again you're threatening um, knight takes g3, and so how do I defend? Um, I, I could either move the king or move the queen, or use one of my rooks to defend. Um, so, so does it does that work? I mean, if I move the king, I've still got knight takes pawn forking my queen and my rook, so it's still it's still a problem. Um, so. So really, I have to move one of the rooks, and so actually, moving either rook is is a, is we're still it's actually an equal position now because black has got has got this wonderful attack going despite being material down, um, and now the rook swings into h6 with check, um, and king g1 is forced, and at this point, actually. Um, Knight takes g3 uh, is would have been the correct move from black, um, hitting the queen and threatening uh, rook h1 and winning and winning this rook. So rook takes f knight takes g3 would actually have forced rook takes knight and f takes g3 and now we see this this uh, position which is almost the position we're looking at but unfortunately. Black needs a few moves. It just needs maybe one extra move. Well, not to there because the knight's covering the square. Maybe so. Black kind of needs an extra move and doesn't quite. It's not quite there yet. Um, so spoke queen. So but white can just about defend with queen e three. Um, so the key is actually to give up. Do something like give up, giving up the knight. Rook f three. Uh, rook g six. Rook takes g3, and and this position would, would actually be equal, but White's just given up um, the piece, uh, and and of course playing this, I thought I'm 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 material up, and I didn't want to um, give up material, but actually we did, I didn't have to play this line, but my, my mentality in fact throughout this game was I'm material up, and I want to hold on to that material. I I felt like sure I'm in danger, but I'm winning, and I want to hold on to material, and probably the lesson of this game is knowing how to give that material back. Um, at a suitable point, uh, just to just to make sure I'm safe. Okay, but he didn't play uh, knight takes g3, which that would have been a very good move. Um, he plays e4. Um, but the problem is I didn't find the correct defense. So after e4. There are a few moves which are good for white, but knight e6 is really especially good. Um, because after knight takes g3 then, rook takes g3, f takes g3, something like queen e3, queen to e8 maybe. Um, there's actually knight takes bishop with the advantage of the knight is actually covering uh, the tactic square. Because we saw this is a dangerous tactic of sacrifice your rook and bring the queen in. Knight takes bishop covers that dangerous tactic square, king takes, and then you can go uh, rook to f4 or rook to f5, and they both work. Rook to f4 looks slightly dangerous, so what's the idea here? Because then if rook there, king takes, queen here, check, king here, queen here, the king can slide away, and we're a rook up. Uh, so rook f4 also works, and the idea is just to try and uh, check and take that pawn, I guess. Um, so queen takes, rook g6, queen to c3, check. Uh, and white is, is, is a piece up and should be easily winning in that scenario. 
Okay, but I missed this this uh, knight e6 move, which I should have played earlier on also. Um, and instead I played knight b5, so I thought I was avoiding, you know, these sorts of ideas, which, as I saw, we, we, should, we shouldn't really be worried about. Um, and he took my rook. So at this point, I'm thinking... So at this point, I'm thinking, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to give up some material to try to get safe. And the most dangerous piece in my mind is the knight. So I go check and take the knight. Seems sensible. Um, incredibly, and I, I just didn't see this at all, um, going rook takes pawn is is even better than taking the knight, with the idea that we can just take the knight the next move, potentially. Um, what do I mean by that? If the knight, I mean, the knight is no longer dangerous once the pawn is not there. If the knight moves away, um, suddenly, what do we have here? Um, maybe the, the, the queen just becomes... I think the queen just gets too active, queen d7, for example. Um, but I, I think I was being too materialistic as well. Like, the knight was both a dangerous piece and it was a piece after all. It's quite hard to, to think of rook takes f4. Um, and incredibly, the best move from black in this position is actually just to give up the knight. Um, which, yeah, it's, it's quite hard to believe. But to give up the knight and then to win back white's knight in, in, in that manner, for example. Yes, yeah, so if, if the knight re retreats... We could get something like this, and, and I guess you're saving your white saving his knight. I, I I guess if the knight retreats, you're taking this. So after any, the knight is going to be safe as well. So yeah, so this is the best line for black. Um, but anyway, I took the knight, which seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Okay, queen d8, uh, and I'm. I'm still th at this point. I really thought, okay, I've I've got rid of the danger, and uh, I was worried about the check winning my knight, so I just casually defend my knight, uh, and th this proved to be maybe the fatal error. Uh, I really needed to continue clearing out the menace. So rook takes pawn, for example. Actually, this pawn is more dangerous than my knight, and if necessary, yeah, I'll lose my my knight. It's not not important. Uh, maybe something like this. So actually, if, if allowing, so if black were to just take the knight here, I'm not sure. Yeah, apparently, if, if black were even to take the knight, this is actually quite comfortable for white. You take the pawn, and maybe white is actually some pawns out. Um, but yeah, I guess I still wanted to be a piece up. Um, and so actually the best move from black is is to try and is this kind of line. And you actually give up this knight, defend that knight, and uh, this is a, a bit of a computer line, I guess. It's a bit and this position is about equal, apparently. But it's uh, kind of hard to see that. Okay. Um, so going back to the game, um, so I took the knight. I defend my knight, but now queen b6 comes, and rook f2, and gosh, what do I do? You see, because my king is is can't go to the h file, so it has to block, and the only piece that, that can block is the rook, and suddenly the rook is falling, um, and I don't know, I just somehow didn't notice all of this. So all I can do is go for checks, check. Now. Yeah, probably I shouldn't have. I should have stopped the checks and maybe, maybe run king f1, and allowed allowed him to win the rook, um, but that didn't look appealing. Um, so I was just trying to see can I get some kind of perpetual. Um, but then I just played a crazy move because of course I should go queen to c8, and then queen back, with the idea queen back also check. And then block. So this would have at least it would have stopped the danger. This this line here to here and to here and to here would have been a way of at least clearing out some of the danger. 
But of course, this is still completely losing. But instead, I, I played queen to e8 check, um, and the checks run out, and I lose my, my rook and even queens. Oh, and then I, I go for a slight uh, cheapo with queen to g5, threatening check, bishop h6, queen takes h6, checkmate. But at this point, black's got two queens on the board, uh, and it's game over. So, yeah, so just to quickly recap that game, um, just to run through it again in case people are just joining us. So it was a classical King's Indian, um, which would be very familiar to anyone who, who plays the King's Indian, um, uh, with white just going all out on the queen side, black going all out on the king side. This is the first mistake from black, bringing this knight out instead of the other one. It's a quite subtle mistake, but this uh, knight on e8 is actually d um, doing protective duties on c7. So it's knight to g6 first, then the other knight comes in. So by doing them in the wrong order, he fell for a rook trap, and just by ignoring everything, basically. Uh, and yet... Probably this was the point to take the bishop and bring the knight to e6. But by not doing that, or by delaying it just one move, and again, bringing the knight to e6 was, was essential at this point. And by not doing that, I allowed this little tactic, knight g3, and suddenly it followed up by knight f5, and suddenly this is a really interesting game and pretty scary. Um, e5, he should have just gone for knight takes g3, cashed in, probably a draw, but he it, it worked out well for him. Again, knight e6 was the key, key move for white in this position, and they missed it. Key move for black was knight takes g3, knight to g3, and he found it. So, um, queen g4 check, takes the knight, and then a very subtle mistake at the end is actually taking the pawn is more important than taking the knight. And giving the king a square on f1 to run to doesn't matter about losing this knight at some point. Just took too worried about the knight, not, not worried enough about this pawn. And that pawn's going to be lethal, it's going to win my rook, and it's going to kill me. So well played from Jonathan Coffin. Um, there are about 40 people on uh, Lee Chess. Um, there were about 40 people on Lee Chess watching, so Abos asks, if you played rook takes f4 instead of a4 to defend your knight, wouldn't that keep the knight as well? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, so the point when I played a4. Yeah, so if I played rook takes f4, so I was worried about queen here, queen b6, uh, rook f2, and queen takes knight. And what... And so yeah, I lose the knight, but I shouldn't have been worried because I've actually got a stable position now. The attack has died pretty much. Um, and I think I'm pawns up. I think I'm three pawns up at the end of all that. So yeah, my king is slightly less safe, but hang on a sec, black doesn't have any pawn to mount his king. So he's got stuff to worry about as well. Um, yeah, so this is actually, this would have been completely fine. Um, yeah, I said well, I seem to only have seven people watching my stream right now, but uh, when this was happening live on Lee Chess, I wasn't even streaming it, and I had 40 people watching this game just because it was such a fascinating game. Um, it made more sense before we did that. Cool. Um, yes, so, so going rook takes f4 first. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this. I, I find that this is a really hard move to find. I mean, if I got this sort of position again, would I find rook takes f1? Again, I, it's incredibly hard to, to to give away that piece and just to say um, this, so this sort of position. Just re recognizing that by, uh, at least by doing this, you're actually saving your knight. Yeah, in this sort of position, you are indeed saving your knight um, because once you take here, uh, any move like yeah 
I'm not quite sure what I'm thinking there. So, because what happened in the game was, yeah, okay. So any move later, so first black has to take two moves to even get there. But, um, yeah. But uh, even if he does get there, any queen there check, the knight, once these two pawns are gone, the knight can come to d4. So yeah, that was that was that. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the round two match. So okay, so like round one, I felt I was completely winning and now lost. So <laughs> that was that was the beginning of my season fifteen. Um, so round two is loading up, and it was um, a French defense. I was black against Ask the Dust. Um, okay, e six. He plays the advance. Okay, so I play c5 immediately, and I play, I play knight c6 first, and then I play a very obscure move, queen a5. Um, it's not the best move in the French, um, but I, uh, against quite low-rated opponents, it seems to be quite effective. It's not really the move to, to bring out for a, a long-rated game or against higher-rated opponents. However, it's it can be a bit tricky, and I still play it sometimes. So what's the idea? Um, it's simply that I'm pinning uh, the c3 pawn and therefore putting pressure on the d4 pawn. The traditional move, of course, is to play queen to b6, directly pressuring the d4 pawn. Queen to a5 is a kind of subtle variation of that. Um, and the reason it's such a fun move is because often uh, white plays bishop to d2. Um, and that, if white plays that, then black is quite comfortable because he goes back to b6, and this is in fact what happened in the game. Um, and he, he, he wanted to go to b6 anyway, but now he goes to b6 with tempo, hitting this uh, b2 pawn. Um, and white has a choice of either moving the bishop back to c1, <laughs> So black's just got that move for free, and now so black can play another move, which of course is ridiculous, and human beings would hate to do that, although sometimes they do. Um, or the only other move to defend the b2 pawn would be a move like queen to c2 or queen to b3. But the problem with these moves, of course, the problem with queen to c2 is there, there are three pieces attacking this pawn. So actually, this is actually a fork of these two pawns. So queen to b3, at least any, any capture on d4 can be met with an exchange of queens. So it might indeed be... Um, so because the exchange of queens is a threat, black might even ex choose to um, exchange queens straight away. Uh, although another line is actually playing f6 first, and then there's an exchange of queens, and, and this sort of position might arise. Um, before we go to that, probably say what white should play against queen a5. Probably the best move is just taking this pawn. Um, and uh, if black plays queen a5, the important thing to remember is not to take with the bishop. That would be a blunder. Um, because of this. And uh, white is suddenly a piece up. <laughs> Um, so if white does take this pawn, there are actually two possible moves for black, either recapturing or just dropping back and recapturing later. Uh, probably at the master level, they would recapture, uh, re recapture later. But um, recapturing immediately is completely fine. Uh, and as a sample line, bishop to d3 and then break. And white's going to break, uh, push c4 at some stage. Black's got a bit of development issues. And so I'd say white is slightly better. At the master level, when this has been played, black has dropped back to c7. Uh, prefer to drop back to c7, putting pressure on the e5 pawn. Um, that pawn's defended, and then you try and go for this pawn. Because that's with check, and then drop back the queen. Again, black has... Uh, white's got a lead in development, black's got some issues. But, yeah, um, again, white is slightly better. Um, another move, as well as taking the pawn that white could play, 
is a3. That's also a perfectly decent move. Um, and the idea is that any capture on uh, d4 can be met straight away with uh, b4. Uh, so actually, if white does play a3, quite a nice move for black in this position is just to take with the knight, knowing that the pawn can't recapture, but takes back, takes back, and b4. So the recapture on the pawn will happen just a move later. And so this would be a sample line in this variation. Again, quite quite comfortable. Oh, a little this is actually quite quite comfortable actually for black, but there's actually a very it's comfortable for black, but it's a very interesting um, approach to this position from black, playing f5. And white wouldn't really want to take on Passon because obviously the bishop comes in, targets a weak d4 square. Um, but f5 and then g5. Uh, and the idea is that weakens um, the pawn on e5. Takes This would take this bishop. So it's an exchange of pawns. Um, and if he doesn't take, which of course is a better move, not taking, you slide across, he slides across, and we get a little uh, kingside skirmish starting out. So th that's another way of playing. I'm, I'm basically teaching people how to play against my openings, which is very wise. Um, but what happened in the game is kind of what I'd love to happen in future, which is people play bishop to d2. So always play bishop to d2 if you're playing me, but if you're playing someone else, then, then I recommend either taking the pawn or playing a3. Or if you forget to take the pawn, you play bishop to d2, then play queen to b3 to stop to stop all the nonsense to, to, because otherwise you're losing a pawn from the fork. Okay, whereas my opponent just completely ignored not only the fact that I was attacking this pawn, but the fact that I was attacking this pawn as well. I was like, what? <laughs> like, sometimes people might forget to defend one pawn or the other, but my opponent just ignored both. Um, so that was pleasant. Um, and it gave me a kind of pleasant choice. Well, which one should I take? Um, and of course I took this one because it looks like a rook's hanging. And in fact, however the knight moves, like the knight moves, I'm winning the knight. Yeah, it looks like I'm getting a rook at the end of this. Um, now if, yeah, now what white played is, is simply attacking my queen. And at this point, I, I thought for about 15 minutes. So like I had 45 minutes, it's a 45 plus 45 game. I actually had 45 minutes, 54 on the clock at this stage. And by the time I played my move, I had 36 minutes on the clock. So I spent, well, yeah, a good 10 minutes thinking about this, this move. Uh, and of course, the best move in the position is just to take the rook. But I was a little bit spooked. Um, because... The queen felt a little bit trapped there. And so it, it did require calculation. And, and I did do the calculation. Queen to c2. c takes d4. So the idea is you want to break the center because then the queen can get out. Um, but white would like to go bishop b2 trapping the queen. But the problem is the moment the bishop interposes, the queen no longer defends a2. So it's a quite hard. How does the bishop, uh, how does white actually attack this queen? Queen is trapped, but how to attack it? In the meanwhile, white tries to break open the center, and if, uh, black tries to break, break open the center. And of course, white has to be quite sensible and not, not take. Otherwise, knight takes, knight takes, queen gets out. Okay. But now, how does black actually get the queen out ever? Um, to be honest, the answer is they don't. Uh, and, and this is something um, there are people in chat watching, I think Quirk in chat was saying. You should just take the rook, it's obviously fine. Um, it's not because the queen ever gets out, because it may be the queen gets out, it's quite possible the queen doesn't get out. So for example, this is a line with, with best play, uh, you're just, you're, you're trying to break through, you're trying to distract the queen so that you can take on a2. Okay, and, and you get this sort of position where and it, it, white can, in fact, make sure that uh, the a2 pawn is defended and the rook on f1 hits the queen. What I hadn't factored into my calculation um, 
is that that's the second rook for the queen. We just won one rook. We could just win the second rook. So that's not actually a problem, <laughs> losing the queen for a rook at this stage. Uh, in this in this particular position, there's actually knight to d4, takes, takes, and we're not losing the queen at all because uh, we're attacking um, the white's queen. So after knight takes d4, queen takes, and we get out. Um, if rook takes, knight takes, and we're only losing a piece. But we won, we won a rook earlier, so uh, everything's looking splendid. So it is, it is, but this is rather a scary kind of proposition of can the queen ever get out? Um, and instead of bishop c1, actually a more scary move is castling straight away. Because um, then when then it's certainly true that black will have to give away the queen. So we see a line like this, because this very quickly puts the rook on the line of the queen, takes bishop here. Okay, so I mean, this is just one particular line. You could go d3, queen b3, knight here. And again, try to attack the queen, because if you can attack the queen... But still, even if uh, queen goes here, so queen takes a2 would be met by queen takes c6 and queen takes rook, so that wouldn't be so nice. So queen takes rook, king takes, and, and defend. Um, so there are definitely situations where white can, in fact, trap that queen in the corner. But the thing to remember is, even if it traps the queen, he can't trap it with a minor piece. You can only trap it with the, um, with the rook. Uh, and then the queen is is so not only in the while while this queen trap is happening, black can improve his position in various ways or use the fact that white's pieces are really concentrated on trapping this queen to get some certain advantages. Um, so if if instead of queen b three, for example, white played bishop takes d three, this is another possible line. Um, takes the pawn, takes here. Okay, he finally gets out, but he's just lost. So much material along the way. Um, so basically, going back to the initial position, yes, black is definitely winning a rook, but in order to take that rook, he has to be prepared to give away his queen for some material, but it's going to be sufficient compensation for the queen. But at this point, I, I was, I couldn't see an obvious escape route, and so I just withdrew. I mean, I was saying, well, I'm a, I'm a pawner, he's completely undeveloped, I'm I feel like, yeah, I've got a nice advantage as white. In fact, according to Stockfish, it's only minus 0 0.5. So that's maybe a questionable how nice an advantage it was. Bishop a3. Um, probably should have just castled. Um, and, but OK. Said he did this. And now I return <laughs> to b2. Um, so I felt during this game, I was I already like grabbed a pawn. I, I felt, why am I so greedy? <laughs> but queen b2 is, is in fact the best move. Um, and the reason is, because in order to defend the rook, he has to now um, bring out his knight, but now I'm, I'm winning the d-pawn. So so suddenly I'm two pawns up. He finally castled. Oh, I, I just felt so greedy during this game. I just took a third pawn. Hi there, Costas. I'm doing very well, thanks. Uh, he attacks my queen and I step back um, and I've got a bit of a development problem because my king is a little bit precarious um, so just just defending so all fairly obvious moves at the moment uh, a6 just to try and stop the knight swinging in to attack my queen and then swinging in to c7 I had to stop that rook to c so he's just doubling up his rooks on the c file while I'm having trouble developing okay so here how do I get my king safe? So I came up with quite a nice plan, which was um, because my king's on a dark square, maybe I could keep it on a dark square. But in order to do so, um, at least that way the, the light squared bishop can't target me. Uh, but still the queen could target me, but my pawns are not defending the dark squares. So at this point I started pushing these pawns just to create a defense along the dark squares, and that's, now I've got a nice haven for my king. Um, so that was that was the plan. Now, rook c8 looks... Yeah, rook c8 looked like a bad move when I saw it, and I just looked across and it says, yeah, indeed, that's a bad move. Um, you never want to move your rook. Your rook's on a light square and is being hit. 
If you move it to another light square, it's just inviting the bishop to hit it again and pick up that pawn. Um, so that was a terrible move. Um, moving it to a dark square is much better. Uh, even rook to b8, maybe. But um, yeah, rook to a7 is a, is a, okay, actually it's not. It's actually not such a bad move, but um, rook to a7, rook to b8 have got to be slightly better. Um, okay, so that was inevitable. Okay, so knight to e4. So at this point, this is quite a nice position. Um, where can... Okay, so actually, just if I want to actually, I, I wanted to say something earlier. Um, if I don't want to back, just backtrack a little. Um, instead of bishop to f3, yeah, white did actually have, so white is actually in some trouble in this game, but white had a very good move in this position, uh, which I guess I only saw after analyzing it with Stockfish afterwards, which is f4. Um, I mean, this is a huge problem, the threat of taking on f7. Um, yes. Okay, so see you, A-boss. Uh, and hi there, Eren. I like rook c8 a lot. More active rook, and you're still up two pawns. Rook a7 looks passive. Hmm. Okay. So we will, we'll get to that in a second. So I was going to say f4. Yeah, wow, this is a, a really strong move. Um, it would have forced e4 just to keep that file closed. Um, but now there's a queen moves hitting d4. Okay, so I go d3. That looks like we're winning a piece, but we're not winning a piece because queen takes pawn, hits the rook, and you hit the queen, and he wins the other pawn. Um, there's basically not much you can do to stop both those pawns dropping, basically. Um, and black is actually still winning in this position um, with, um, with some crazy tactics. Um, but so, okay, so actually, so why, 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 why are we sacrificing both these pawns? So we are sacrificing both these pawns, but all black's pieces are suddenly coming alive. So we're hitting the rook. We're now hitting the rook again. We're now hitting the so pushing it, pushing it back. We're now hit, hitting the queen, but the queen can't really go anywhere. So if it goes here, there's knight, knight here hitting it. If uh, it can't go here, um, the, the queen really doesn't have anywhere to go to. Um, so you, you you basically whatever you you have you, you have some exchange. So you're winning some kind of exchange at the end of it. So f4 very interesting move. There is very good defense from black, but it involves giving up those two pawns. Uh, e4 is correct, queen c4. What would have, I mean? What would the alternative be? Um, I guess. I guess there really is no alternative because there's just no way of defending these pawns, is there? Let's see. There are two pieces attacking this pawn. Uh, what else could we do? It's quite hard to see. We could maybe try and. If we really try and hold on to these pawns, we are going to get into trouble. But what's amazing is that king somehow stays safe on, on f8. So it's just a really quite interesting line. So yeah, going back to this. Rook c8. Hmm. So rook c8 is fine. It is on the on the active um, on the on the it is active on the open file. Um, but maybe the idea of rook a7 is then swing swing over to c7 might be an idea. Um, so it's only a half centre pawn, according to Stockfish's analysis. But I think, as a general principle, putting your rook on it, it is always a little bit risky because of this bishop b7 tactic coming in, um, just picking up that pawn. Okay, but now it, it is true the rook is very active on this file, and knight e4 was a very interesting. Um, move in this position, because where can this rook go? The bishop cuts off this diagonal, so th those two dark squares cut off by the knight. Um, it can't go here because of the, dame of, of the potential pin of the two rooks. It could go to either of these two squares, and it can't go here 
because although if it goes here, the rook can take it. And the pawn can't take it because the pawn is pinned, but anything else. Um, so there are only really two squares it could go to. It can actually go to here completely fine. You can't take it or, or you lose the queen. Um, but the problem is after, after rook d3, there's knight c5 picking up an exchange. And after uh, rook e3, there's also something. Knight takes f2. I'm trying to remember, what was this? Ah, oh, this is nice, because then you're taking the rook with check, is the idea. Okay, so it just throws an intermezzo of hitting the queen, but the idea is you then take the rook with check, so you lose your knight. Um, so, yeah, the rook has nowhere to go. Um, very nice, very nice tactical shot. So knight e4 was a really nice move in this position. Um, he went for rook f3. Again, just a slight intermezzo hitting the queen, and then... Uh, pinning those two rooks. Like, wh why hit the queen? I guess because it just makes the queen less active. If you go straight away for bishop here, it's it's fine because f7 is actually covered by the rook. But still, uh, that queen is on a dangerous diagonal. It kind of just kicks the queen off that dangerous diagonal, and now you're hitting those two rooks. Uh, and at this point, black was already down several pawns, um, down two pawns, and just about to be down an exchange. Um, Stockfish says minus seven. Point six for black, and so indeed, um, so black resigned. Oh, sorry, white resigned in this position. So that was the the round two. Um, so after round two, in that intervening week, um, I saw the the video by Anna Rudolph about um, Alpha Zero's amazing win against Stockfish where it gave up all its pawns for activity. Um, and I mean, so it was this, this sort of position here where this, this pawn is under attack and this rook is under attack. Um, and it, it didn't have to, it didn't have to fall for this. Um, there were other moves it could have played earlier. Um, I think, what was the point? So this was the game. I can play it from the beginning, in fact, just just for, but but many people will know this game already, because um, it was sort of one of these real highlight games where Alpha Zero is white and Stockfish is black, and I just wanted to uh, just mention it because it was an inspiration before I went into my round three um, game. So this was a curious move because of the tactic where he's allowing the rook and the pawn to be hit. That looks like a a basic tactic that Alpha Zero has missed. He's allowed his king side to be opened up. They've got no problem at all. Uh, and then he goes and sacrifices another pawn by going rook g4, sacrificing the pawn on h2. Um, and then, and then it was the point where he sort of very casually moves his king over to the to the uh, to the queen side to be completely safe. And just the bishops really become again just. Not taking back, trying to look at open lines. Um, the knight can't take. Why can't the knight take? If the knight were to take, then queen takes. Oh, I see, and then this pawn push is coming. So it's really Alpha Zero is super aware of open lines in the position um, and giving away loads of pawns and these two bishops along, the, along these diagonals, which is incredible um, but yeah uh, just just wanted to mention this as a, um, a, a style of play that was an inspiration before I went into my round three match um, and made me a little bit more casual about material I guess because I'm, I'm usually fairly materialistic um, so yeah and then now Alpha Zero just gradually improves his pieces improves his king position and Stockfish designs because um, these two pawns are under attack. The bishop's going to swing in at some point and target them. Black can't defend these pawns. In the meantime, in the meanwhile, although white's only got two pawns, they're they're very secure. Um, the extra piece is going to target these pawns, and uh, this will be an easy conversion. Okay, so in my round three match, I was up against Itzel as white. Um, um, 
and it was uh, a kind of boring opening. A Queen's Gambit declined. Most um, not expecting an exciting game. Um, d4, d5. Um, it's very normal stuff. Exchanging off bishops. Okay, so actually, I have to say, this was all in a way preparation up to the move bishop d3. I mean, just because I'd seen that he'd played these sorts of uh, moves before, but I had no real plans in this position. Um, just felt like a nice position to play as white. Um, knight e5 made sense. Um, so, and, and this has been played by masters before, I, I guess, up to this point, up to bishop d3. Um, and then we'll see. So castles, castles, c6. Okay, so at this point I play c4, just threatening to um, maybe t if, if takes takes, there'll be an isolated queen's pawn. If takes, knight takes, maybe white will get a big center. So it's cr just asking some questions really. So black decides to take himself and himself push c5. So in fact, threatening to create an isolated queen's pawn for white. Um, and this position played queen b3. Uh, so accepting this isolated pawn. Um, and really the, the correct move for black in this position would have just been bishop to e6, you know, meet, meet a threat with a counter threat. Play the boring move. Um, boring position, play the boring move. Um, and yeah, indeed. Um, but things suddenly got exciting when he played knight d7. So I guess that was a mistake. Because it allowed this sacrifice, knight takes f7. Um, and I was just, you see, I did, it's like in the stock, the queen and bishop lined up against the king. It's like, okay, I can't win the material back immediately, but, but now I've got this cool pin and maybe I can exploit it. Um, and the line I was thinking was rook a to e1, queen f8, and I had actually considered bishop takes rook. So this is what, in fact, Stockfish later said this is what I should have played. Bishop takes rook, queen takes, rook e8. Um, the queen is pinned, so can't take the rook, so he has to play knight f8. Takes, takes, and then double up the rooks. And I, I, I'd, I'd seen up to here in my, in my, in my own analysis, um, but I just thought I've got a rook for two pieces, maybe, yeah, a rook and a pawn for two pieces, a rook and, yeah. I even got, yeah, a rook and one pawn for two pieces. It's true that black's pieces are a bit underdeveloped, but I just thought, oh, they, they can get out okay, no. What I hadn't realized is, no, 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 they can't get out okay at all because this rook would swing in with check and pick up any bishop on b7. Uh, and bl black is completely losing this simply because this pawn is just going to roll. Um, so uh, just to continue, um, if if something like knight to g6, stopping the rook coming in um, to, to the square, the pawn is rolling. And you win the bishop for the, for the pawn. And, okay, now this is actually quite comfortably winning. Um, if, on the other hand, he goes for this b6, well, the pawn is, well, why can't you go b6 and then here, let's say. I'm going to have to ask the engine. Why can't we do that? Okay, we just roll again, and why can't we do this? Rook takes, bishop takes. It rolls again. Oh my goodness, yeah. There's nothing to stop... There's nothing to stop the pawn queening. It's it's quite a quite a nightmare. Um, so yeah, I'd calculated up to here, but I hadn't seen quite how deadly this this pawn, this isolated queen pawn, is actually a wonderful piece um, rolling down the board. Um, so I instead, what I was going for was torture, <laughs> slow torture of black with this pin. So this this. Just my plan is simply double up the rooks, but I mean, sure, black's in a pin, but there's no way black's going to get out of this pin, was basically the idea. 
Um, so, okay, rookie two, planning for doubling up the rooks, put the rook here, and yeah, we'll, planning for torture here. <laughs> Hi there, good chess mind. Yeah, I'm about 1900, 1950. Um, so he did knight f6, and I double up my rooks, and he develops. He has to try and get, he has to try and get himself out of the pin. The point is, he can't just move the king straight out of the way, or he loses a full rook. So he's trying to reroute his bishop to here so that he can get out of the pin, which he does, and. And then I take this this pawn here. Um, so what's the idea of that? I guess I'm threatening to double up the rooks now on, on the seventh file. Um, and the problem with it, if rook takes queen takes, I have a I have a, a pin on the back rank. So if rook takes knight would have to take. Um, and again, I, if the knight ever moves, I've sort of got a I've got a check. I've got a potential pin on the back rank. In the meantime, I have a pin here. So this is a really curious position because uh, there's so many pieces on the board: queen, rook, and bishop against queen, rook, bishop, and knight. Um, I'm actually a piece down, but black's pieces just can't do anything. <laughs> and so, as long as they can't do anything, white can um, cause quite a lot of trouble. Um, so I go, and and of course, I've, I'm two pawns up. That's that's the key. I don't have a FIDE rating. Uh, I've played in a FIDE tournament once, but I didn't get a FIDE rating from it, so I'm not sure why. Uh, so I'd say even black is in zigzag in this position. So he can't move the rook because it's pinned. He can't move the bishop except up and down, or bishop takes rook wins a, a full rook. Um, he can't move the queen anywhere again because there's a rook. There may be a back rank issue at some point, but this pawn is actually just for now guarding against that. So actually, the one so you could move pawns, or you could move his knight. But if he ever moves his knight, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it can even temporarily move his knight. So if he did, if he ever moved his knight, something like this, rook to b8, moves his knight back again. Is there anything? Yeah, okay. I could actually I could actually double up on that. Um, if he ever moved the knight or queen to b5. Uh, so yeah, he can't even move the knight because suddenly I can double up on the back rank instead of doubling up on the rook. Um, so basically the only pieces he can move in this position are pawns. Okay, so he, he moves some pawns. Um, so it's, it's it's really... My ECF, that's a good question. It's, um, it was 129 when I quit when I was about 13 years old and it was one two six or so when I was eleven. So I mean, it, it kind of or well, one two one, then it went to one two six, went to one two nine. Kind of didn't go up very much after I was about eleven or twelve years old. Um, so then, and then I thought, I thought I'd do more important things than chess. And just recently, I've come back and said, no, I think I think chess is, <laughs> I think chess is something important enough to do. It's quite interesting actually. Um, yeah, so you can only move pawns, and the problem with the pawns is. His bishop's getting trapped, and that's not going to be good. I mean, the bishop will be trapped. The rook will still be pinned. Um, so he he gives up and loses a piece. And so at this point, I'm an exchange up, and I've got two extra pawns. So I do exactly what I would want to do in this position, which is trade down material into a winning endgame. So quickly get the queens off, stop any perpetual check nonsense. Yeah, just take off, push push the past pawns. Um, rook here just to stop the knight even coming back into the game. Uh, push the pawns and threaten mate both here and here and game over. So I, I think yeah this was a game I was very I have to admit this is a game I was very proud of, um, even though I guess it was quite a it was just one simple tactic in a way, um, um, sort of it was quite boring opening and <laughs> just it, it kind of shows shows just one one slight 
you know, sometimes you just have to play the boring move. If, if, if your opponent is grabbing a file or a diagonal, you have to oppose it. And if you don't play the boring move, then, <laughs> well, it can get interesting in your favor or it can get interesting against you. Um, so yeah, as we saw here, I should have just, I should have just cashed in bishop takes rook, but because I was, in, and probably normally I would have done, but because I'd just been watching Alpha Zero, I was, <laughs> I was trying to, I was trying to torture the opponent a little bit, um, not not meaning just exploit the maximum I could from this pin. Uh, I think I did a pretty good job of it, just getting absolutely everything. Okay, and game over. So it was a game I was very proud of. This one. Um, and uh, people in chat afterwards compared it to, to Mikhail Chigorin against Jakubovic, 1879. So I'll, I'll just show, explain why that was um, brought up. Because in that position, in that game, um, uh, White played rook to g1 here, seemingly sacrificing uh, the knight. Um, but the reason for that was so that they could go bishop takes pawn check. There's a, uh, the only move black can do is to block rook to g7, and then you double up on the piece. And it's very curious, because Stockfish at this point is still saying 0, 0, but yeah, it wasn't 0, 0 for long. Rook to g8, queen comes to h6, and Stockfish is suddenly kind of realizing, yeah, it, it isn't the fact, it isn't that, um, doesn't the black has blundered? It's just simply Stockfish just doesn't realize, uh, <laughs> doesn't realize the peril black is in. Um, bishop to c5, swinging the bishop into the defense. Simply e6. Um, okay, so what is e6 about? Let me think. So it's trying to distract the queen so that then you can mate on g7. So the queen has to to step back. And now there's a very subtle, um, subtle sequence of moves. So f4, now what was f4 about? Uh, I'm just trying to remember now. Um, so we, so we, we, we try, we've got this horrible pin on g7 and we're trying to exploit it. Ah oh, yes, I remember what f4 is about. This is very nice. So f4, bishop to e7, bishop swings back. So we just, bishop just gets it right out of the way. Why are we going f4? Now this is a very subtle move, um, b5. Um, because what he's hoping for is if white were to play f5, suddenly black has mate in three. Queen here, check. Queen takes pawn, check. Um, rook g2. Queen takes rook, checkmate. So b5 was a, quite a subtle move. Um, and white had a, a very subtle reply, which is f3, simply blocking off that diagonal. Um, and then f5. Okay, so the point is that pawn can never be taken because otherwise you cash in on g7 and mate. But the reason for this f5 suddenly becomes clear um, in the end of the game. Rook to g3. Again, black can't do anything but push pawns. He's in zugzwang. Queen takes h7. And now f5 becomes clear because the, the rook is pinned, so the rook can't take back. So the king has to take back. And now rook h3 is checkmate. So that all subtle pawn push, push f4, f5, was all about executing this little tactic with queen takes h7. So um, it's a, another example of exploiting um, exploiting a so you sacrificed a piece and then exploited a pin. So it seems like a bad idea to exploit to sacrifice the piece, but when the opponent's piece is all pinned up, it doesn't matter how many pieces he's got. As long as you have to be careful, you have to be careful about little tactics like queen a8 suddenly mating you. Um, and then, boom. oh yeah, so it's not mate because of bishop h4, but yeah, that's true. And rook takes h4, checkmate, good good spot, Nelson Moore, and welcome. Um, so I have to say, usually on this channel, I I post Crazy House, so I'll just give you the link to my YouTube, uh, I post Crazy House content, but um, I do also play chess, and occasionally I post chess videos as well. Um, okay, so going now on to round four. So round four, I was against um, AXP156, very strong player, and I was black. 
Um, and I was slightly afraid of playing um, the French defense because I know that sometimes I get attacked quite heavily on the king side in the French and didn't have confidence in it um, against a strong player. So I went for a perk. And I've done this a few times in the 45-45, and I have to admit, I'm yet to win <laughs> a perk. It's like I bring it out for the strong opponents, uh, and it hasn't it hasn't brought me fruit yet. <laughs> um, but I play the King's Indian against d4, so I thought, well, why not play the perk against e4? Um, but I kind of feel like every time I'm making the same mistakes, so we'll see again. Queen to d2. Okay, so very important in the pack is you let white occupy the center, but as black, you must challenge the center. Uh, and the bishop can really come alive at some point in the game, as long as you, you do challenge and break open the center. Um, and of course, white can always kill that bishop by just going bishop h6 and exchanging it off. And that's a kind of scary prospect, because whenever that bishop's there, you can feel quite safe on the king side. But when it's exchanged off, it's much more nervous. Um, but okay, so c5, I learned my lesson from my last one. I need to break the center. Um, before I'd have been a little scared of doing this because I'm worried, you know, takes, takes, I'm just opening up a beautiful file for my opponent. Do I really want to do that? Or if he advances, then what? Then if I advance here, takes, takes, and then again, I'm just opening up this beautiful file for my, for my opponent's rook and queen, which are beautifully kind of set up to take over the center. So... This is what makes me nervous about opening up the center, um, I have to admit. But just when you play the part, you just have to open up the center. Like, even if you sacrifice pawns, it's like, if you let white overrun the center, you will be slowly ground into the dust. Um, so c takes d4, knight takes d4. Knight c5, f3, bishop d7. So, should I feel this was quite a success? in a way. I, I should have analysed this in more detail, but so far as feeling this is going quite well. Um, I, I've got a nice half open rook file on his king. My, my own king is reasonably safe. Uh, and then with this move, I mean, he's just given away, he's given away his his light squared bishop, and I, I don't know, and I've opened up my own bishop. Okay, so everything's looking pretty decent, basically, to my eyes. Um, now, yeah, Stockfish has crazy ideas. Stockfish says just go for b5 here. Um, like, open up files on his, so and then take, and just, that's putting pressure on that knight, which then has to, uh, to step back, bishop and queen both hitting the knight. Step back and do that. Just double up on, <laughs> double up on Bush. It's it's such a that's the Alpha Zero style of thing. Anyway, that, that's what Stockfish recommended, and it's like when you see it, it's like wow, that's actually really nice. Uh, but um, yeah, I didn't didn't think of that. So it takes takes again. It really likes B five, but okay. Bishop H six, and now here again, the Stockfish has crazy tactics which I I did not see at all. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just give it. Knight d3 check. Um, really? So the idea is, if he takes with the pawn, you're just going bishop takes knight, you're saving your lovely bishop, and you've got a beautiful attack on, on white's king. That's just, just beautiful. But if he takes with the queen, you've got bishop takes bishop check. And again, you've saved your bishop, you've got your light square bishop, and again, you're really comfortable. My goodness, I mean, that is such a nice move. Okay, so, and if he just ignores it, king to b1, um, what do you have then? Okay, maybe, maybe I'll leave that, maybe I'll make that an exercise for the chat. What move should black play in this position if white plays king to b1? Um, but this isn't, this isn't from the game, this is, this is crazy, cool stuff. Uh, so first I missed the b5 idea, and then I missed this beautiful knight d3 check. So the idea is if king b1, is the knight just hanging? 
Um, can we just go Bishop takes knight still, maybe? So Bishop takes knight actually is quite good in this position. Um, okay, actually, I'm going to give it away. It's just take this pawn. Um, take this pawn, then take this knight. Um, oh, take this pawn, then take that bishop. Oh, yeah, okay. Rook takes c3. Kind of painful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why this certain move order is better than other move orders, but takes takes. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, no, you have to take it that way around, don't you? Because if I took the knight, I'd lose the rook. Yeah, okay, that does make sense. And then why not go queen takes c3, king b1. So rook takes c3 is better because... I guess the queen can come into here next. But yeah. Okay, so you're winning a pawn and you're basically blowing open white's king. So wow, that was a that was a move. I didn't even see it after the game. That move, I, I just I, I looked at the game briefly. I, I didn't see it then. Um, I only saw it just doing the analysis. But okay, I played knight a four. And here's just this is a one tactic. I mean, I was really disappointed to miss. Um, so he got, he goes knight takes. So queen takes is very natural, because he's just taken my knight, take back. But there's a, just a simple intermezzo of, of taking his queen first. And of course, the bishop will hang unless he takes back. So take here. And this is a really comfortable position for black to play. The white knight is hanging. There's a threat on c2. Um, actually, everything can be defended completely fine with knight b3. But this is just really nice to play for black. It's yeah, black is equalized. Um, so this is the one move I, I really feel that was really disappointing to miss. Which way three knight a four? Yeah, after takes just queen takes queen. Um, and if he does, if you don't take, well, I've got quite a lot of pieces pointing at this square, so it's quite a lot of pressure. Um, so that was a really disappointing tactic to miss. I just I just took back and takes takes, king b1, and it, it's white with the much more comfortable position. And and now is the key again. I, I in the perk you have to break open the center, even like at this stage where you think, oh the opening's done. White still has this central pawn. Um it's just the sort of yeah, yeah, e6 was necessary. And it was especially necessary here because the pawn on e7 was very weak. I was still obsessing about attacking the king somehow and maybe doubling up the rooks attacking c2. I didn't realize how weak e7 is. So what happens in the game is rook c7, he just attacks e7. And I'm like, how do I defend this? And I had to give some kind of lateral defense. But this is just, yeah, all my pieces are suddenly moving backwards. So the move I really needed in this position was e6. Okay, it looks risky because this pawn is maybe a little bit precarious, but and white is slightly better in this position, but this is still this is still playable. Uh, instead, I played rook c7, and this is a sort of nightmare. <laughs> he chases my queen back. He's doubling up his rooks on the e file. Okay, and he's actually going to swing over and try and mate me on the h file. So queen here takes here checkmate. So h5 only move. C4. Okay, his, his queen side is completely stable. Um, queen to d8, just hoping for some kind of fork, I guess, um, I imagine. So actually, maybe this was my last chance. Still, again, e5 straight away was possible. And actually not taking back, just going here, and then coming up the way. Um, and either, either swapping off rooks or going... A4, A5 first and then swapping off rooks is the stockfish line. The idea being um, stockfish doesn't really want to take this pawn. Uh, yeah, because the rook defends it, <laughs> of course. Um, takes, takes, and then he takes the pawn, but yeah. At the end of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So black's a pawn down, but the position is stable at least. Um, so yeah, E5, again, the last chance to kind of just challenge the center. But okay, I played queen to d8, rook to e4. Um, again, black, black is suggesting a move b5, which is real 
Like, what's that about? But that's a really nice move, actually. The knight is guarding f5. So, and if c takes b5, you just, you just take this pawn. So, wow, yeah, that was a really nice tactic as well, to try and stay in the game. So basically, I think this is what I find in the pack. There are all these sort of chances to stay in the game, but not, not chances to even draw a level, just chances to, to still be in plus one or plus two and have a playable position. Um, and I go f6, and again, rook h8 maybe just keeps me in the game a little bit longer. f6, and my position is completely collapsed. The queen's coming in, the rooks are coming in. I, I don't really. <laughs> I think the less said about this, the better. I think. Uh, check. Just hoping for some perpetual, maybe, but check. Nope, he's he's coming in, and with a little tactic to finish, he wins my queen. So yeah. Um, could uh, Aaron asks, could White have played g4 after h5? Um, so so he did play g4 eventually after h5. Um, the immediate g4. Okay, hang on. So in this position, so I, I at the moment I'm actually threatening this pawn. Um, rook h5 is nice because it's just a mating two threat. Uh, g4 is just a bit slow because he, he needs to defend this pawn first. So he has to defend it and then he can play g4. And, and I think um, instead of going rook here, could he have gone g4 now? But now I've got a counter threat, I think. I'm threatening e5, hitting hitting the rook and the knight. So I've kind of parried that temporarily. Now, of course, I should have played e5 instead of queen d8, but queen d8 at least does stop g4 for one move. Um, again, I should have played b5 there, but a6, b5, I was trying to think about. And now he finally does play g4. So he gets in the g4 idea. He was con he couldn't get in earlier. Um, And yeah, so you're suggesting g4, rook takes b5, and knight f5. So knight f5, okay, let's have a little think. So the knight's checking, so I have to take, so, and if I don't take with a rook, then I'm, um, I'm losing the rook, so I better take with the rook. Um, and then you take back. And has black. I so I I'm yeah. I'm winning a um a knight and a pawn for my rook. And I I'll actually just look at what Stockfish says here. It says queen c three, queen f six. So yeah, I mean Stockfish actually prefers black in this position. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, I got. Seem to have some pawns as compensation. Um, one. So it's a piece and two pawns for the rook, but for some reason Stockfish just just slightly prefers. Um, I guess the rook's a little bit out of place. There aren't nice open files uh, for the rooks to really play on. Um, yeah, that rook's a little bit stuck defending this pawn. So, so white white can take. There's no rush. White can secure his position and then play g4. And there, there is no rush, and he played it almost perfectly. Um, like rook e4 is the second best move. Queen f2 is better, but queen f2 apparently is better. Um, in fact, the one instead of going rook h4 straight away, c4 was maybe uh, an improvement. Um, for him, but yeah, there was very little wrong with with what how he played this. Um, C four was just perfect. Rook e four is the second best move. Um, then b five comes, um, and then I just yeah, I I need to play a move like rook h eight to to stay in the game.
So it's so I guess it's still lesson and still it's still a lesson in, in playing the perk. Um, first, watch out for really crazy tactics. Um, so the first really crazy tactic was, yeah, don't be afraid to to just go all out against that queen side. Try and sack a few pawns. Um, yeah, try and look for crazy. Wow, what a crazy tactic, right? Knight d3 check. I mean, that that would have been like a, a move of the league kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, but then just very disappointing. Disappointed myself not to see simply queen takes queen and then bishop takes knight. I mean, because th it was exactly the kind of, that was almost like why I played that move in the first place. Um, so I don't know why I didn't follow it up in that way. And then I guess the other thing is just not, so then the importance of breaking in the center, uh, e6. And I guess sometimes in some openings I find I, I double up, I double up on, uh, on attacks which are not really fruitful. So recognizing what, what's a useful attack and what's not. Like trying to double up the rooks on that file. And, and then this is just bad defense. Um, as just the rooks are basically creating open files for themselves and he's just invading on along those open files and nothing much to be done. Okay, so that was um, round four, I believe. So we're halfway through. Um, so uh, round five was against Tunka Boilu. And it was also a Queen's Gambit declined. Actually, I'd say this is probably my worst game uh, of the season. Uh, so I was black. I was white. So a, a frustrating game because I really should have won it, but I lost it. Um, so again, it's a Queen's Gambit declined. Very sort of boring kind of position. C5. Now, yeah, C5 is interesting because um, it's... Yeah, I'm often told that you shouldn't really play c5, you shouldn't really close down the position on the side of the board where you have space and where you want to, to create things, where you want to make some activity. Um, so on, it does cement in white space advantage, but it does also just kind of block in all his pieces. And if black ever wants to sort of attack on the king side, he can be like secure in the knowledge, ah, oh, white's just, just blocked up blocked up the queen side and can't do much there or, or it'll just take a lot longer to get these things rolling up the board. Uh, having said that, the real problem with c4 often is it can immediately be challenged with b6 and at least here after b6, b4, a5, a3, the usual problem is if takes takes there's a rook hanging. So the one thing to be said in, um, in favour of c5 is um, the tactics do work out. If this, 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 uh, everything is all connected. Um, and I, I guess the reason for playing it is I felt black had played quite passively and I kind of just wanted to shut shut in the dark squared bishop. And um, this game has been played at the master's level and actually c5 has never been played um, at the master's level. So um, that could be a kind of warning. So knight h5 bishop to e5. So giving up the bishop for a nice knight in a way. Um, and the knight could be kicked, but then that would create too many weaknesses on the light squares. Could be kicked at some point, but I guess it, it would just come into the light square. So it, it's, for, for the moment it's safe. Knight to f6, b4, just again, just cementing my position. Knight to d7, f4. Um, so I, I get double pawns, but I'm just kind of cementing a really kind of strong structure in the center. Um, A5, B5. Um, and at this point, black made a mistake. He should have just castled. I mean, he should have just maintained his structure um, and castled. If I play B6, sure, it looks nice, but actually there's no way of making progress in this position. Everything is completely blocked out. Um, so black is actually completely crashing in this position because white can't do anything on the <laughs> on the queen side. He just goes f6, and he and uh, actually black is just <laughs> uh, 
Black is just doing very well. And um, so but white has to, has to actually take, but takes, takes, bishop d3, um, f6. And, and it's very frustrating because in this kind of situation, you don't want black to take because otherwise you disrupt your pawn structure. Um, but if I if I take, then the rook file is open and I can't castle. So if I castle takes, yeah. So, so what I was saying is the best move for black in this position was castles. And on the face of it, this is very concerning for white because you have to take, take, and then try and get castled, but you can't. But it turns out white does have a very cunning resource, which is queen to g4 intermezzo. And the threat is simply queen to g6 and try and mate on h7. Um, so queen to e8 to stop it, bishop to g6, pause, um, pushing the queen back. Bishop goes back to d3. And so that, that would be kind of a, a repetition if, if that repeated. Okay, but what if the pawn pushed? Um, then you can actually just sacrifice on this. So it doesn't actually, there's, there's still this, this issue. Oh no, that doesn't work. Hmm. Sorry, not, yeah, queen takes, not bishop takes. Yeah, queen takes is the issue in this position. Um, and this is still equal, but it's just very precarious. Rook takes f1, rook takes f1. Um, yeah, black has got one move, which is bishop f6, and now he survives. Um, if, if queen h7, it, uh, the black king gets away. So actually, um, black would be winning. Um, but actually, in this position, rook takes f6 is the, is the move. Um, if g takes f6, you'd be losing, because queen h7, king here, queen h8. Well, let's just play it there. Takes, takes, king here. Sorry, this is slightly laggy when streaming. Queen to h8, king here, just defend the queen. Um, queen to g7, king to e8, forced, and bishop g6 is checkmate. So that's why you can't take with the pawn, um, but you can take with the queen. Um, and apparently this, yeah. So actually you, you abandon the h7 idea and go for this. Okay, so it's a crazy position. Um, I don't understand it, to be honest. Um, black has only got one good move in this position. Um, like, why can't... If you did something like this, you're getting mated on the back, you yeah, queen, queen to e8, queen to e8, check, queen to f8, bishop to h7, okay, you're winning the queen with the tactic. So, black actually has to give away the bishop and get the rook in here. Okay, so a kind of crazy, crazy line. So, that was all just from one point of, yeah, why can't you play pawn here? Okay, but there's lots of other moves you could play. So we've shown that if, if queen here, just bishop here, and we have a kind of repetition. So white is holding on at least. Uh, what if bishop here trying to block off the queen from coming in? Then then you just take. Takes, takes, and you you put you cement your knight in on b6. And yeah, it's and th yeah, this would be very nice. If you can get your rook to f7, then, then you're doing very well. Um, maybe there are, yeah, f8. There was some move that was bad along the way for black there. Um, yeah, queen, queen to d8, apparently, for example. Keep it, maybe. Yeah, no, that doesn't work, because, yeah, I'm not sure. So let's say this is, um, so basically, bishop to g5 is dangerous because of that of those lines I was showing. Um, hi there, Juicebold. 
uh, Black's Peace Discoordination. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's quite interesting. So in, in this, if, you ever, if I ever got into this position, I'd be very scared as white. But actually, castles takes queen g4 is really interesting position. Um, and again, I'd, I'd be imagining oh, but then this, but yeah, takes takes takes, and this it's not yeah it's not all over, and it's at least a draw for white. Um, so that's why castles was good for black here. Yeah. Um, but he took the pawn, and this is a, this is a very, not a good move at all. And really, at this point, I, I kind of felt really good as white playing this knight takes. The knight is coming into d6. It's going to be a monster knight. It's defended by both these pawns. So secure. Um, like, huge space advantage white has. I'm going to eventually get castle. I'm going to have an open rook file here. I'm completely dominating on the queen side. Such a nice square. So, sorry, such a nice position for white. Okay. But it's an illusion. So firstly, because although the d6 square is lovely, Black has both b6 and f6 to distract both these pawns. Um, so the d6 square is not as secure as it looks. Um, and it turns out knight takes b5 isn't actually a very good move in this position. Um, the, the best move is bishop takes b5. Uh, you don't really want to go king f8, and then I castle with a rook file staring down at you, so you go bishop d7. Um, the thing about bishop d7 is I've then got queen a4, and whether you like it or not, I'm basically exchanging off all these diagonals, and I'm turning it into an endgame with this dominant position. And now suddenly this is just completely beautiful for white. But... By going knight takes first, he, he simply castles, bishop b2. Um, so actually b6 was really strong for, for black here, yeah, just b6 straight away. In fact, b6 is such a good move that you don't, obviously you don't want to take it, because otherwise you, you, you're losing control of the squares. Um, so the best thing white can play is actually um, c6. And actually, the, the rook can swing in and defend this pawn. Um, bishop to b4 check is a little bit annoying, though. Um, so yeah, this is actually fairly equalish, maybe slightly good for black. But yeah, mine is 0 0.7. Um, now, bishop g5 is a mistake because now when he plays b6, I do actually have c6, and he doesn't have this check. Um, okay, so he can do a move like this, bishop a6, because this c6 pawn is surprisingly secure, because what piece of white could hit it? The bishop can't get at it. The only piece that can hit it is the rook. But I can just... Yeah, I can first need to secure my knight. So if he ever takes my knight, I take back, and that pawn is very secure. If he hits with the rook, I defend with the rook. If he tries to double up, I can double up. So this is actually very comfortable for white. I, I would just it'd still be a comfortable position. Um, but I didn't play that. I, I simply took the pawn, secured the knight, which is fine, and then castled. Um, okay to c1, rook to c4. And so this is still an equal position. Queen to b3. Yeah. I just didn't really see rook to b4. And then at this point, us it's sort of the sort of position where you, you think you're winning, and so you, you want to, you must be winning something. I mean, you just feel you've been, you, you, you had a good position earlier, and so you feel, are you, yeah, so I guess a lot of the time when you make mistakes is you kind of misassess a position, and you think, you know, because I, my position, because I was winning earlier, I was thinking, you know, I must still be doing well instead of thinking you know how do I how do I stabilize the position uh, and instead I was kind of creating a little bit of instability and just going for a little bit of 
crazy tactics that didn't work. Um, so rook c5, I mean, just just even at a glance that you can see that move is dangerous because it puts the rook and queen on the same diagonal. I mean, maybe it's completely fine, but it's just, you can see that it's, it has a kind of instability to it. Um, and indeed, he played bishop e7. And at this point, I should have just dropped my rook back, just simply dropped my rook back here. Actually, black doesn't have any dangerous discoveries. Um, but, and in fact, actually, I was trying to think, what if I I'd played rook here straight away? That doesn't work. Queen takes. Ooh. Really? You give up the queen. And black's winning in that position. Okay, that, that's that's interesting. For three pieces. You you give up the queen for three pieces. Yeah, so that's not good. Um, so even here, actually, he has queen takes c7 as an idea. Okay, but he had much better, which was... So rook c7 is a terrible move, because um, the knight defends the rook, and black can just snip off the knight. And now I, if I take back the bishop, I lose the rook. So I need to go rook takes bishop. But the reason I played this, I, I had seen bishop takes knight, rook takes bishop. Um, but my plan was after bishop takes bishop to then go rook takes pawn check. And I was just planning a, repet a repetition because my team just needed a draw in this game uh, to win to win the round. Um, and just like at, at the point when I'm about to play um, rook takes pawn, I notice, oops, he has rook here check. Rook behind the king check, and snip off the rook. Oh, and everything's gone. Completely gone. I mean, like, two pieces down. So I, I try and hold on at this point, but I'm... I So I've lost a piece, basically, here. I've lost that piece. I lost another second piece. So I'm down a piece. I'm down a piece, and there's just... Couldn't see a way of getting counterplay. Um, so things just exchange off, he plays it well, and in fact even gets the mate. So yeah, good good game from Tunka Boilu, taking me down in a Queen's Gambit decline. So three more games to go. Um, round six was black against Paolone, um, and it was a French defense Tash variation. Um, so e4, e6, and I followed this line re recommended to me actually by Raoul Robert of swinging the knight over just for sort of classical Tarash thing. Um, I guess normally in this position I would be considering playing c5 straight away, um, but I just played this line, it looked interesting. Um, it's more very, very classical. Queen to b6, uh, and I was quite surprised to see him castle, because he completely ignores the fact that I have three pieces on this pawn, and he's only got two defenders. Um, but this is actually um, a classical sacrifice uh, in the French defense. The queen finds itself a little bit in no man's land. Sometimes you even sacrifice a second pawn. If you're too greedy, it's probably not always a good idea to take the second pawn. Um, so knight f3, kind of run away with my stolen, stolen pawn, uh, and queen to a4. Um, now I, I need, as black, I need to develop desperately. Um, and this queen to a4 move is both stopping my bishop from developing because my knight is pinned, but it's also threatening to transfer over onto the king side. So queen to b4, um, I didn't know at this point, this is actually still book, um, but I just found it as a move trying to exchange off queens and trying to stop this queen going over to the king side. Queen to c2, this is still book. Um, and the annoying thing about this move is it's targeting h7. So bishop takes h7 as a threat. But there's one way, there is a way of playing this, just saying, well, okay, if you take h7, you're going to have an open h-file on your king. Um, 
So you can sometimes play queen to c5, again, just offering the queen trade. If white's in the mood for a draw, then we could just have a repetition. Um, if not, white could also take the pawn. That's also a reasonable thing. And this is a fairly equal position. So white's regained the pawn he sacrificed. <coughs> so another way for black to offer the sacrifice back instead of playing um, queen to c5, is playing um, knight to c5. So he takes the pawn, and then at least develops the bishop. Hits the queen, queen comes over, and at least the queen's making sure the king is safe, um, and might also even create some threats on white's king. And so this is actually quite a pleasant position, I think, um, for black to play, even though Stockfish does, does say it's a a slight advantage for white. Um, but the move I played in the game, okay, it's also book, is is pushing the pawn. Um, but maybe this is not the best move. So if I were to play this again, I probably wouldn't play h6. Um, and the reason it's not the best move is the move I really feared during the game, which is bishop to d2. Um, the queen would have to go back, and then the queen comes back to this, its outpost here, and it's threatening to swing over to g4. Uh, I could develop a little bit, but it's even you can't even castle because of the threat of bishop takes h6. I mean, this is this is just a nightmare. I mean, Stockfish just says plus 0 0.9 for white. King f8. I wouldn't find that move necessarily. Um, it feels like a nightmare to play. Uh, so... I was really scared of bishop d2, but um, Parloni instead played a3, and that was, again, I offered the queen trade, he comes back. Uh, I just tried to stop his bishop and queen doubling up with my king. Again, he should have swung his king over, queen over to g4, that slightly would have been slightly concerning. Uh, but instead he attacks my queen, okay, I offer the queen trade again, and this time I'm just trying to develop my pieces basically and at least now I've covered any kind of dangerous uh, checks on my king pins so I swap off pieces again offer the queen trade again and he, he refused again but I keep trying <laughs> um, okay I finally get myself castled and he offers the queen trade this time okay so of course I accept <laughs> but he thought okay I've got nice compensation now. I've got this nice attack. I've got a rook on the seventh file. And it's true, but I've got time on my side. Um, the tactics sort of don't work. So white, I, I, I hit the rook with tempo. I developed the other bishop. I developed, hit the rook again with tempo. And I, I, I'm, I actually can challenge the file. So we can go into an end game, and I'm a pawn up in the end game. So that didn't really work. Um, it is just one pawn. It's just one pawn, but it is a pass pawn, it's a protected passer, so... Um, and so I kind of trade down a little bit. I don't mind trading down into a king and pawn endgame, a pawn up. That would be very profitable. Um, but I'm still slightly worried at this point, can I push the pawns through? The, the bishops are of the same colour, so it's, it should be okay. At this point I'm very confident, because he, he goes trying to chase these pawns, but I can see this pawn runs. So check, it runs, it runs again, and now it's, it's it runs to be a queen. Um, so quite, I mean really there's a bit of an opening skirmish, um, which it, it, a kind of theoretical battle even though we didn't know the theory probably, at least I didn't know the theory. Um, this, with this, I mean, because in theory we're following, even up to move 13, we're still in book, even though we didn't know the book. Um, but then this is a mistake, h3. And in fact, a, uh, a3, and h, h6 is also a little bit of a mistake. You, the best thing to do in this position is to give back the pawn. Yeah. Okay. 
So round seven. Okay, I'm going to give a puzzle in round seven. Uh, so get ready. Nice easy puzzle to start with. So round seven was, uh, and I'll just tell you about it first. It was um, I was white, and I knew that my opponent played the Dutch. Uh, I haven't got much experience against the Dutch, so I was trying to choose some kind of opening to play against it, and I opted for something called the Hopton attack. Um, and I should actually, sh before I even show you the game, um, I really enjoyed a game. Um, so, yeah, I should say also, if my opponent had played knight f6, I would have been quite happy to take that knight and play against this kind of structure. Um, this structure is very possible to play against, it's very possible to play as black. Okay, you've got double pawns, but um, you, uh, black plays d5, and there is a certain, but black does have quite good control on the light squares. Um, but the key is white, I think, is to target the d5, um, the d5 square. And if you can get through on d5, start plugging away at, at e6 and so on. So really trying to target these light squares. Um, so, sorry, white's got good, good control, or trying to get good control of the light squares, but the big problem is he's pushed f5, so f7 is weak. Uh, so you try and target these light squares. He's trying to protect them, but f7 is not is, is weak, and so the light squares are a problem. Um, so h6, I wasn't necessarily expecting, but I had I had prepared something against h6, uh, which was uh, bishop h4, g5. Um, now I want to just share e3 threatens queen h5 mate, so that would have been a fun end to the game. Pawn takes bishop, queen h5 checkmate. Um, Knight here, bishop plots back. So this is not the game. This is a game between uh, Serowan and Gurevich that I had looked at before the game uh, with the idea of h4. So you drop the bishop back and then press play h4. And obviously, you're threatening to open the file and take the rook, so he has to defend the rook or push past. Um, if he defends the rook, you just exchange off and his king side is kind of shattered. So he pushes past, and then an interesting idea from white is actually to push again. This pawn is actually defended fine by the rook. Um, and you're going to swing the knight in to give it a second defender. So a nice move from black is to swing the bishop to attack it again, but you can swing the knight in as a second defender, and the knight might eventually nestle in on g6. So in the meanwhile, you might challenge that bishop, that's one possibility. You might cast queen queenside. And this is the game which Saruman is white against Gurevich. And he takes off that knight and he gets a central knight from just which is quickly taken off. Are you gonna challenge that file? Apparently not. Um yeah, c4 looking like a dangerous move, but the idea is he's just gonna move his slide his king over and and double up. So you see, I, I have to wonder, like, how come he could double up on this file and this is a good move, whereas when I doubled up in my perk defense, it was a bad move. And I guess it's because they're not that many defend. White's pieces are not really defending um, the king at the moment. So it forces a push, and that creates weaknesses, and uh, Saruman probes away. The knight eventually does settle in on that beautiful g6 square. Okay, and I, I seem to have... Um, I seem to have just lost my position. Okay, but let's just let's just quickly, rapidly look through this uh, game. You, you get a kind of feel of the kind of play. Just probing into the position and doubling up, treating, switching to the other side, and so on. Um, yeah, switches the rook over to the other side and then just manages to pick up a pawn or so. And yeah, he picks up an exchange and uh, at this point black resigned. Okay, so this puzzle I want to say is d4, f5, h6, drop back. At this point, I play bishop g3, so nice easy puzzle. Why can't black play f4 and trap my bishop? So tempting.
types to put it on the board. Why not? What would I play as white in this position? Eren says e3, indeed. So e3 threatens queen h5. Checkmate, and it also threatens to take the pawn on f4. So it's a double threat. White can defend one threat, but then you're just winning a free pawn. You can defend the mate threat, but then you're winning a free pawn on, on f4. So defending the mate threat might be something like g7, for example. Um, and then you just win a free pawn. So kind of very basic uh, tactic that any any Dutch player, obviously I, I was new to the Dutch, so this is a, a nice little neutral trick that I saw, but any Dutch player has seen this little tactic before. So that's why he plays knight f6 and doesn't try to trap my bishop, and I have to quickly play e3, because now the bishop trap is live. Um, bishop g7, and just like in the Sarah and Gurevich game from 1992 that I just played through, I play this h4 idea, g4 and then push past h5, um, e6, knight e2. And so at the moment, black does have this idea of swinging the bishop in, just like in that other game. But instead he went for e6, probably because he saw my knight is, is in time to defend this pawn. But still, it's still a good plan, because the bishop on f7 is quite a good defender of the light squares around black's king. Um, so, in fact, there are games exactly in exactly this position that have gone bishop e6, knight f4, bishop f7, bishop here. I mean, this is just another another example of a game that ended in a draw. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not going to go into detail. So instead, he played e6. Now e6, I play knight f5, uh, knight f4, of course, queen to d7, and now I play bishop to c4. Um, and I've got two pieces attacking the e6 pawn. And he could just move the queen out of the way, and then he's got two pieces defending it. Um, but the move he played made me quite pleased with my position, because he played uh, d5. OK, so that does force my bishop back. Um, but it does create a lot of dark square weaknesses. I have a dark square bishop. It creates lots of weaknesses. It creates a possible, you know, Nice outpost for my knight on e5. I mean, even I could go knight g6 to e5 in future. Okay. So it does create a lot of weakness in this position. And of course, I drop back and straight away play c4, just keeping on plugging away at his light squares, because f7 is weak. He goes b6. Yeah, b6 is a big mistake. So still in this position, it's fine for black. but. He should takes, takes, castle, and maintain position. He still has one, two, three defenders of this pawn, and I've only got three attackers. So to take, just to make sure the queen doesn't become a fourth attacker on d5, um, and just maintain position. Uh, b6 is bad because, not because of that. b6 is bad because of an immediate tactic which is this, um, seemingly pinning the queen to the king. He doesn't pin it because the knight can interpose, but then play knight g6 with the idea of knight e5 picking up a piece. Um, and in fact, that knight e5 is so dangerous that you don't move the rook in this situation because knight e5 is just, just, picking up a, just picking up a piece and even maybe another piece. Um, so in fact, in this position, you just play a move like bishop g7, and you say, please just take my rook, leave me alone. <laughs> and actually, if you're stockfish in this position, you say, I don't even want your rook, my knight is better than your rook. <laughs> so this is a very nice position for white. Let, let's just say you take the rook. Um, this is your exchange out. And 
quite a nice position. Um, but there are probably even better moves. Um, apparently knight c3, even. And just prepare to castle queenside, blow open the center, and yeah, this knight is a great piece. But I'm, I kind of saw bishop a4 and move too late. Um, I was thinking going knight g6 and then go bishop a4. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was thinking a long time actually on this move, um, 10 minutes, more than 10 minutes on this move. And I played the wrong move. I mean, I played knight g6 first, which is arguably the wrong move. Um, and now he takes on c4 and it doesn't work anymore. Um, if bishop a4, b5, whereas before the pawn was covering b5. So, so I was very disappointed at this point. I've missed my chance. Um, I still got a nice position, so I just just play solid. Um, Bishop takes c4, but now he, he can move his rook out. Okay, so just keep on playing solid. Knight c3, bishop to a6. I mean, this, this bishop is probing. Um, so he's trying to exchange it off, which is quite sensible. The best move in the position. Um, so I went knight to e5, just hitting his queen. But no, no obvious tactics. Um, and with uh, queen to b7, he's hitting g2. And... Yeah, so it turns out the best move for white in this position is, is just not to worry about uh, b2. You know, let him take b2. I mean, I'm going to come in with my queen. I'm going to go check. I'm going to try and invade with my queen along the light squares. Okay, he could take my rook. So what? He could even take both my rooks. Uh, I'm going to mate you, that kind of idea. Um, what if you just push? Oh, let's just have a little stop which says. Oh, then you invade along the dark squares. So it's like atomic. If you, if, if you try and invade along the light squares and your opponent blocks you, they just switch color complex. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is almost mating. It's sort of plus 20. Um, whereas, or plus, yeah, plus 8 to go bishop takes e6. But it, it takes a certain... The thing is, it's for, it takes sort of... There's no... It's quite difficult to calculate a concrete line of how exactly. Queen a4, b5, bishop a7. Yeah, so it's, this, is, this is what well, the challenge is. I couldn't see a concrete line, and of course, he's in theory taking. Okay, but of course, if he, if he does let you in, then there is going to be something concrete. Um, what is that? Yeah, so even here, Sokish isn't calling mate just yet. So there's queen e6 check. Um, king here, no. Knight covers. Um, oh yeah, there is mate king here. Just this knight g6 checkmate. Um, so king to e8 would be forced, but so we've got this bishop coming into action. Okay, so knight c6 check. Knight takes c6. Okay, yeah. So queen to d6 threatening this checkmate. So he has to defend with the knight. So Stockfish is, is finally seeing something. Um, but it really isn't easy in a way. It's really not easy. So now if there we could just take it. So there's no point going there. So he has to go to king to c8. But now we can take the knight with check. Um, King to b8 is forced now, so now we can. Can we swing our bishop back with check? Um, apparently not. So if we this would be a mistake. If we did this, it's just a draw because of bishop to e5, and he'd get a perpetual. So this shows some of the, the difficulty of the position. But if we go bishop to d8, threatening mate in one. Um, then we can somehow avoid the checks, apparently. King to d1, queen to a1 check, 
looking to see to. And the checks run out. So really, bishop to g3, why is this a draw? This is quite shocking to me. Because then he's got bishop here, bishop takes bishop, knight takes, and we lose control of the dark squares. Queen d6, king here, yeah, and so on. Uh, but, 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 yeah, if we try and check, the knight will interpose. So the best way I can do is get a, a repetition. So, yeah, so you need, you need to find bishop d8 or bishop to e7, somehow bypassing this dark squared bishop. Um, but yeah, so it is made for white, but it it's just difficult to calculate a line. Um, so yeah, finding something concrete was hard. So without finding some, something concrete, I went for instead for queen a4 check. And you can't really interpose because I've got three pieces hitting this square. Uh, so you move the king out of the way. Um, knight g6 check, king f7, knight. And instead of going back to e5, I, I went back to f4, protecting g2. Just really trying to stay solid. Unfortunately, it means he can swap off that dangerous bishop and bring in the queen to defend e6, because queen takes e6 as a threat. d5, good move. Knight takes d5. And here... Yeah, here I missed definitely the, the best move, uh, which is knight c takes d5. The idea being that when he takes back with the pawn, just simply um, dropping back to here, I'm attacking both this pawn and this pawn. Instead of just taking the pawn, just actually switching to this pawn. And if he tries to defend this pawn, this, the other pawn is going to hang. Um, but it just avoids all the, the complications which follow from taking the pawn directly. So in, in the actual game, I took with the other knight, takes and, and like this. And the problem is that knight then gets pinned. Um, and the right move in this position is is just a castle, so it defends the knight and the queen can move out of the pin. Uh, instead I, I dropped back, defending the piece which was pinned rather than the, the, inter, um, the intermediary piece. Uh, knight c6 and then castle queenside. Um, and if you'd found the right move in this position, which was to go straight away rook d8, uh, Black would have finally equalized, pretty much. Um, but instead, he tried to bring his other rook back into the action, which, on the face of it, since it seems like a sensible thing to do, but it left open a tactic, uh, which I had been hoping for. And the tactic was knight c7. So the queen is, is pinned to the king by this king, so this effectively forces a queen trade. But the trick is, when he takes my queen, I don't take back immediately. I first throw in a check. And then take back. And and basically all white's pieces are very, very active, whereas black's pieces are not. Um, and it, it's slightly reminiscent of the uh, of the round three game against Itzel, with the pin, trying to exploit the pin. Okay, so he tries to challenge the, the piece, the rook, which is giving the pin, so of course reinforcement, so that the rook is replaced. He defends the pinned piece, and you just attack it again. But something actually to be watch out for is I can't do like I did in the other one, just, just add another piece into the fray, because otherwise I'm actually losing this. Takes, and he takes the rook. Um, so it's like you... you you tie up the opponent's pieces, but then you have to capitalize. And the way to capitalize is materialistic, just grabbing pawns. Um, so while he's untangling, I'm grabbing pawns. And takes, and this is like all my pieces are just 
really flowing smoothly through his position and it's, <laughs> it's quite sad for him in a way because he hadn't done that much wrong it's just one one little trick and um, yeah and the the one little trick of the queen takes queen and the intermezzo move and just with that one trick my pieces are active and his aren't and because I now have extra pawn I'm just trying to trade down so check takes takes tries to trade down the bishop and there's nothing really you can do to stop the trading down because otherwise I just win more pawns and so yeah I'm up three pawns in the rook and pawn endgame and he resigned um, so that was round seven and uh, yeah that takes us now to round eight and round eight I prepared the most of any round um, because our team was in third place in the league so I had to really try and win my match um, for the team and it turned out it was a decisive match uh, for the team to help the team um, win round eight and therefore win um, silver in in um, season 15. Um, but also I was playing an opponent who had beaten me in exactly this opening just a few weeks earlier in rapid battle and the opening is the king's indian but unlike the king's indian we started off with i'm black and it's not a classical king's indian um, it's an indian he delays knight f3 he delays knight f3 in the other back you play bishop to g5 in the semi other back you go bishop to e3 um, and the idea of bishop to e3 is to discourage c5 um, but actually it's worth saying that c5 is actually a very interesting move um, even played at the highest level you sacrifice that pawn um, and your bishop to become very active and this is a very different this is feeling strange yeah yeah i guess that's right yeah i see you defend that okay so it feels a little bit different from usual king's indian structures um but this is just an example just a sample um i've, I've actually annotated this quite carefully so maybe i should go through it a bit more slowly uh, so if c5, d takes c5, d takes c5. Um, so bishop takes c5 actually is never played at the highest level. Um, the pawn is never taken, but it can in theory be taken. Knight c6, because if it were taken, knight c6, queen a4, knight to d7, bishop to e3. Okay, swing the knight in. Um, yeah, this is just a an interesting line. Um, so why is it interesting? Um, so why is it interesting? Um, so I said about this position, white is a pawn up but black has the bishop pair. Oh yeah, h5, quite important move. Why is that an important move? Um, no, it's not an important move. You can play any kinds of things in this position. But if he plays h5, queen takes c5, white would now be two pawns up, but it's not really an advantage. Anyway, so I think I've gone in too much detail, to be honest. Oh, I see. It was a crazy tactic I found in this position. Uh, you, you lose loads of pawns, and then you go, you go and sacrifice and pin. Takes, takes, queen there, and takes this one. Okay, so it's just a crazy little line where... White is threatening checkmate and black gets perpetual. So anyway, it was just a <laughs> it's just a stockfish line that I was just quite interested in. Um, so at the highest level, if they don't take, what do they do? I mean, I just I should really just say um, takes. They play e5 at the highest level, and maybe they're they're only like a dozen games, but they are high class games in this position. Um, so for example queen takes d1 has been played, uh, rook takes d1 and knight can go to g4 or to d7, okay so g4 so anyway so it's just very playable. Okay but um, 
Instead of going c5 immediately, I decided to, to support c5 with knight a6. Um, and this is uh, quite a common idea. Um, other, other moves in the position are going e5 straight away. Uh, not going for a c5 push, but going for, for e5. That's also very standard. Um, but I went for knight a6, going for the c5 push. g4. Okay, so this is the move that Ling Guyan Fan used and very nicely beat me um, in rapid battle. So I was expecting it. And um, the move um, comes from uh, a, a Simon Williams video, how to how to beat the King's Indian, where he describes two games by Grandmaster Sokolov, uh, where he beats the D Dutch Grandmaster Jordan van Forest, and then beats him again. Uh, Jordan van Forest used a slightly different variation and was beaten again in the same line, and I think hasn't come back to it since. Um, but maybe he will try again one day. Um, and yeah, it, it did make me feel like. <laughs> Is this refuting the king's Indian? Uh, how am I going to get? How am I going to overcome this g4 move? Because I can't play my usual idea. So I can go knight e8 and e5 and f5, but it's like white is now going to castle queenside, and my my attack is not really coming to anything. Um, and then any f5 push is just going to get taken. And okay, so that's why I went for a change of plan with c5. I did this last time as well against him, but decided to do it a bit better this time. d5, and now e6. So it's like in the perk, just breaking that center. Um, and this is valuable, so you've got a nice bishop diagonal. Um, so not going for e5, going for c5, keeping that diagonal open and breaking the center. Um, so worth mentioning at this point, that g5, knight d7. Okay, so something very interesting here is last time, instead of playing knight a6 to support c5, I played knight d7 to support c5. And there is a subtle difference, and that is that when he plays, if you were to play, as he did last time against knight d7, g5 immediately, now with the knight on a6, I actually have knight g4. Because if he takes it, I can take here. So I, I lose the piece, but I'm gaining a piece back in, from this pin. So takes, 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 takes would be an example line. Just went in here, steps back, and then drops back. And that, that, that might seem crazy, like why are you putting your bishop on h5? But actually the bishop's quite stable on h5. Surprisingly, um, and the knight knight is re-centralized. Queen might go to g5. Look, oh yeah. So that's and that's the other weird, weird one. After pawn takes pawn, you don't take back immediately. You go e6 first and then take back. Um, so why is that? If you take back immediately, what would be the disadvantage? Um, the knight, oh yeah, the knight could come in and hit it. Hmm. So quite a subtle point that going e5, e6 first, then take back is better. Yeah, quite subtle. So, um, yeah, so this very nice idea of going, if g5, I actually have this move, um, knight g4. And if he doesn't take, if he hits, I can always just exchange off on the bishop. Or something. Um, so really nice idea. Um, so, and it's all because my knight was on a6, not on d7. So like small things like this. Subtle, subtle changes to the position. So he didn't actually go g5 immediately. He went for d5. And I went for e6. And this is... Um, and now he goes to g5, and of course now I can't go to g4 anymore, and I go to d7. And on the face of it, now also in this position, actually originally I was thinking of, because I had we, I'd prepared this line quite thoroughly, I was thinking of going to h5, because the idea is if you take, take, the queen can take here, 
um, but it's just not that great. Um, the knight swings into b4, um, threatening a, a fork. Um, so rook d1, but then I've got um, b5, just sacrificing a pawn here. Um, the idea being, if he ever takes on b5, player take, take, can activate my bishop. Is that really it? I'm trying to remember what it is now. And if knight takes, 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 yeah. So some just, just activating the bishop. The, the white king is basically stuck in the center. So yeah, I should say the reason why this e6 move is powerful is because the rook is coming to e8. And the thing with g4 is the, the king is kind of stuck in the center slash queen side. It's not really casting on the king side, although it can do. But the point is, at the moment, it's stuck in the center. And e6 is saying, I want to just open up that center. Um, and yeah, so there is this interesting idea of going knight here and actually even sacrificing the pawn, and it's completely fine. But I decided in the end to go for knight to d7, which is a very interesting line, and it's still booked. Takes, takes, takes. It's a pawn sack. Then you go queen to a5, and even invite white to take a second pawn if he wants it. It's a double pawn sack. Um, but white's piece is really just... Black's pieces really come alive. Um, this is just an example, best line. Um, it's only a slight advantage for black, but two pawns down, but slight advantage. Uh, and if he doesn't take the second pawn, just goes back. Um, still, black's pieces are quite quite active in compensation. It's still, say, plus 0 0.4 for, for white. But, um, knight's coming into e5 next, and so on. Um, it's quite an interesting line. Um, so that's what I was thinking of, but he didn't play that. Instead he played h4, and I, I was saying I, I should have prepped for h4. Um, so predictable. Just push his pawns down on my king. So I took in the center, takes, takes, and I wanted to support um, b5, so I played knight c7. Um, so notice how I, I'm not playing the normal f5 like you would in the King's Indian. I'm still go I'm going instead for a queenside attack. So it's, it's worth remarking how different this is from a classical King's Indian, where white attacks on the queen side and black on the king side. But because white has attacked already on the king side, and white kind of white white's chosen first, like black has to kind of go along with that and take the hint that. Yeah, white's already attacking on the king side. I can't attack on the king side. It's just he's already occupied that space. So black is forced, therefore, to attack on the queen side. It's, it's sort of a very logical um, thing to do. And here he played a terrible move, which is bishop takes b5. So I thought when I played this move that it was a pawn sack. I really thought. Um, yeah, I really thought I was sacrificing this pawn. So if knight takes, why does knight takes not work? Takes, takes, yeah. And I've got check. Queen here, check. And I'm picking up the bishop. So knight takes obviously doesn't work. But when I played this, I really thought that bishop takes was sacrificing this pawn, and I'll take, take, queen out, and so on. What I didn't realize, and this is a really basic mistake that we both missed, Bishop takes knight is just a clean piece. You take off the knight and then take the bishop. So bishop takes pawn. It's really a terrible blunder from him. And it was a terrible miss from me not to realize that it was a terrible blunder. Um, because I was just, I'd been doing all this prep with pawn sack lines and I was just determined to sack a pawn. <laughs> I didn't realize he'd sacked a piece on me. So anyway, knight takes, knight takes, queen here. So I've sacked a pawn in order to open up the B file. And I was expecting a move like a rook B1, which would have been probably quite a good move. Um, not quite sure exactly what I'd have done against rook B1. Um, maybe bishop takes, pawn takes. Because if queen takes, 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 the rook is hanging. 
Oh, so rook b1 doesn't work. Apparently. So it takes, takes, rook takes, queen takes, and queen takes c3 is tempting, but apparently the even stronger move is bishop to a6. Okay, so I, but they're both good. Um, just really trapping the king in the center of the board as black species. Well, first rook here, then knight will come in. I imagine, yeah. Yeah, rook b8, knight e5 are coming very fast, as well as bishop to d3. So really, black is just overrunning white's position. So, yeah, so it's not a bad idea, this pawn sack, although I didn't realize. But instead, and probably the best move is knight g to e2, just defending this knight. Um, but white didn't notice there's a threat and played knight to f3. Um, and the problem is that c3 is weak. Um, and so I just take on b2, uh, and it's a simple tactic. But actually, I have to admit, I hadn't, I hadn't calculated the tactic completely thoroughly. Because takes, takes, I did notice after I put... I played it, he has this move bishop to d2. So when I he t when I take his queen, he takes my queen back. Fortunately for me, after I take his queen, I have another rook in the corner. And uh, yeah, that gives me a full piece up. Um, and probably the best move here was then to just withdraw my bishop, but I was intent on trading down in this position. So I did this in the hope for like knight takes knight, bishop takes. Who took my bishop? Uh, now I'm still a little bit concerned, maybe this bishop will come in and eat up my pawns. His only chance in this position, a piece down, is past pawns. So instead of actually taking the free knight, I, I went after the bishop instead. Because I, I was worried, just make sure I don't have, don't leave, give him any past pawns. So then develop my pieces, but he's got the file, that's the one compensation. So I try to create another file for myself, for my rook. And if he ever comes down with check, I can just defend with the rook. Uh, so I, I don't want to lose any pawns. So I attacked this pawn, and yeah, he very subtly just attacked my bishop, because the problem is if I actually take his pawn, there's an annoying pin. And I'm actually losing the piece. So when I realized that, I'd have to just withdraw the bishop, just blockade his pawns, and just try to bring my pieces round. And again, here I thought, well, if I take it, he's going to have check and bring his knight to a very active square, taking on d6, and he's, he'll have these connected pass pawns on me. But what I didn't really fully appreciate is that if I take here, that h pawn is fast. Like, even if he takes here, it's that h pawn is just running. Oh, also, sorry, that pawn is protected for now, so that's, that doesn't need to be said. But this h pawn is just running down the board, and it's actually quite hard to stop. Um, but I was kind of trying to be really secure, and so I kept trying to keep his knight in, under check. Okay, so I gave him a pass pawn, just thinking that my bishop could control everything. And bringing my king in, just pinning that last pawn. And at this point, I'm just taking his pawn, and I just notice, oh, there's a cute tactic here. Um, now, whenever I, you see it, I, I have to say, if you see a cute tactic, you have to really just check three times over that it really, really works. Um, but I was pretty convinced that it worked. Um, so, wow, I, I think I spent only 20 seconds, 24 seconds checking that it worked. So I probably didn't spend as long as I should have done. I, I still had 40 minutes on the clock at this point. Um, so I just <laughs> I spent 20 seconds. I was just really convinced that it worked. So exchanging down to a bishop and pawn endgame, and I should have been a little bit careful because both these pawns queen on, on dark squares. But I was I was quite confident that the king could king and bishop could stop these pawns. But having said that, in this position here, there's only one move for black to stop that pawn from queening. Um, it could be a puzzle, but I'll just, I'll just give it to you. Bishop here check and stops the pawn from queening, and the last pawn queens. And although 
queen against a pawn on the seventh rank is a draw. The pawn is not on the seventh rank, and also the king is too close for that to be a draw. So kind of let him sail a little bit close to the edge and having hopes that he might be able to salvage a draw. Um, and so probably made my teammates maybe a little bit nervous um, with my endgame conversion, but just about managed to, to get it, get it done neatly. Uh, with a, a couple of nice tactics thrown in. Um, but yeah, this game was all about uh, kind of the deadly rook takes b2 here, which really... <laughs> <laughs> really just takes all all white's pieces and just ends up a piece up. So that was very nice. Uh, a nice way to finish the season uh, with five games out of eight and no draws, surprisingly. So five wins and three losses. So that's it. Um, hope it's been instructive, um, these eight games. Um, if, if you're my opponent in future rounds, I'm not going to play any of these openings again. So that's what you should believe. So you won't gain anything by watching this video. <laughs> I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, although probably you will gain something from watching this video. Um, okay, so hope you've enjoyed. Um, yeah, in reality, I probably am just stuck in in the same openings quite, quite a lot. But, um, yeah, hopefully I'll I'll play different lines this time to last time. So. I won't be caught in opening prep. Um, but yeah, I hope it's been interesting. I hope, and hopefully it's also a good way of reminding, reminding me as well of, of some of these opening ideas and middle game ideas um, in these various games. Um, and quite a few games there I was quite proud of. Um, in particular, the game against Itzal was very nice. Um, the game against... Astral Phoenix and the Dutch. I mean, it was frustrating in a way that I had this advantage where I couldn't see how to convert it, but it was it was quite satisfying. I managed to um, managed to somehow maintain a, an advantage almost throughout. Um, just just with that very very nice tactic at the end with the, the intermezzo move uh, when when the queens were exchanged and. Yeah, and um, King's Indian defense is not refuted, so I was very pleased about that. And to be honest, pretty proud about the game with Johnson Coffin. I mean, that was a pretty wild game, even though I lost it. It's very disappointing to lose it, but it was a wild game. Um, and, and a good warning, you can be a piece up, or an exchange up, but if your opponent's got this sort of blistering attack, that can, that can, count, for, that can count for anything. And that's what that's what Alpha Zero proves. So yeah. Okay, so thanks everyone for watching. Hope it's been fun. Um see you uh, yeah, so if you want interested in Lee Chess uh, 45 plus 45, do um uh do do Google up Lee Chess 4545. Uh you won't be able to participate in season 16 except as an alternate, because all the teams have been already arranged, but you could you can sign up and um, as an alternate and get involved in the future. So thanks everyone for watching.